welcome to Combat Sports Talk, a podcast dedicated to UFC and Bellator discussion, the MMA community, and combat sports in general. I'm your host, Ryan Smith, and joining me this week is the entire Combat Sports Talk crew. We got Kalechi Casey Onyebuchi. What's up? Happy. We got John, the keys to victory. Keys. Hey, everybody. Uh, Casey, we'll talk about that salute later. All right. And yeah, got... I, I wanted to redo my whole intro. <laughs> Can we start again? No. Because I, I didn't like anything no. about that. It is that. not live. <laughs> we are live. And yeah, there's no there's no going uh, back. And that we got called out. We got George <laughs> G Money Stallworth. What's up? Wakanda forever. Uh, that's now, where I'm going. So so you know, we were all saying Is this to... your king? <laughs> Man. <laughs> not what I was expecting. Like I, I guess I'm, I'm. I was expecting to... to have like a, a show about what's going on, and you guys are making jokes, and I'm just. Like, I'm, well, I, I feel like this is the time like, honored tradition. I'm, I'm, of... I'm just confused, dude. I'm just. I am. It's no confusing. It, it's duality, it, and. When you're when when you're, when times are hard like this and you can't find laughter or anything else, man, that's when pain sets in. That's when sorrow set in. That's when all those things that are leading to a lot of what people are complaining about taking place out in the streets right now because voices have been are, are unheard. And so I, I think it's incumbent upon us as men of stature, as men of of, of upstanding moral character to continue to be men. And that means engaging in all aspects of life, whether it's sorrow, pain, pity, laughter, smiles, all those things. So I can't, I, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say, I'm not happy to see you. I'm glad all three of you are alive, well, and kicking. So that brings a smile to my face. That brings joy yeah. to my heart because right now, the, you know, I, I don't even want to talk about the other things that are going on in my heart. Yeah, for me, it's more the the catharsis of finally getting a platform where it's it's more people who look like me who understand, and we're gonna dive into something. And to prep myself for that, for the heaviness that could be the rest of this show, I need a moment of breathing and and getting into it. But I, I definitely understand like there's there's gonna be some seriousness here. Like the the world is literally burning around us, uh, and I think interspersed in between that, like a stress response is gonna be some some random, like seriously wow. catchy. <laughs> okay, so um, let's let me go ahead and and put it out here for for the, for combat sports uh, talk nation. Um, tonight's going to be a different night. Um, we're not going to talk about what's happening in the MMA world. We'll save that for another show. Um, tonight is going to be dedicated to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmad Avery, Aubrey, and Aubrey. Excuse me. And um, how we feel about it, uh, we, we, you know, so um, we do apologize if you came to, for the for the sports talk. We apologize, but we're not really apologizing because we, as four four brothers here, um, we we have feelings about this, and it need we need to get this off our chest. So we're tonight we're going to have a what we would call a pure heavy bag session where we're just going to talk and we're going to express our feelings about this situation. We still want you to watch, okay? Because if you got questions, this is the place to ask. Yeah. All right, if you have if you have comments, we want to hear it. If it, it, uh, we want to hear the other side because we have one side of this. And we want to hear the other side. We want people to engage this because this is going to be probably one of the safest spaces to actually engage your feelings and let out. So not safe for work. Please don't, don't, well, you, we're all, we're all confined to home. So it don't matter. Um, <laughs> the language is going to be a little rough mm-hmm. tonight. Um, yeah. Uh, so it, I and, will and, emote and I dare you to say something about it. Like I'll fight you. <laughs> <laughs> and we just want, to, and we hope tonight that everybody walks away a little bit more enlightened than when they were when they first turned us on. That's that's the goal tonight. All right. Um, so where do we begin? Um, 
Uh, you, World's on fire. <laughs> I guess we start with now. Um, you know, uh, I, tonight. Uh, so George called me on yesterday, and we talked for about an hour. And you know, I was telling him that I had not watched the video yet. That I'd only seen still shots of the video because I could not watch the video. Um, and so it, I happened to be watching the news as the president was um, was preparing to speak, and they were playing the clip of a clip of the video. And mm -hmm. in the forty five seconds or so that they had the clip on the air, I was still struggle. I mean, I was still struggling to watch the video. I I couldn't watch the video. I I was turning away. I was, you know, hands over my face. Yeah, watching the video and and to imagine that that video goes on for what is it six eight minutes? Mm -hmm. Well, depending on which one, it's ten plus. But it's yeah, it's a lot. I I I can't. I I I couldn't bring myself. I mean, it's amazing that I can watch a sport where a person can fight and hold another person down, and I can watch the sport of this i can watch the sport of this and it doesn't bother that me was and i can critique it because it's a sport and there's there there that but both people are are at a point where they can defend themselves it is it, it is not a point where there's there's a person who is bound in such a way that they can they can't move and 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 they are being harmed and 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 it, It, it was it was hard to even uh, engage in the video because it, it harkened back to that notion that we were talking about before of if I see someone getting beaten down in the street, I gotta ride for them. Like I can't just let them get beat to a bloody pulp. But it's difficult when you're addressing a situation where any interaction with an officer can lead to my death as well. But at the very least, it's an assault on a public officer. Right? If I try to save someone's life so it puts us uh, it put me in this predicament of like my ethos is i always protect those who can't protect themselves but what about how do you protect somebody who can't protect themselves against like i don't know how to say that better. the person who's charged with protecting them yeah yeah that's that's what i'm trying to get at like <laughs> it's there's so many different factors that are in play there that it's watching that video and my heart wanting to go out and be like, oh, I would totally ride. But it's like, no, I I honestly wouldn't. Like, because there's three other, like, we keep looking at the angle where we're mostly just seeing the one officer, but you've got an entire four people there. Like, it was the cry to humanity that broke me. And I'll be honest, uh, when my non-people of color, because it's not even just non-black, but my non-people of color friends have been asking me, like, where does this all start? It's very difficult because most of them have not watched the video. And for me, who's seen it start to finish at all of the angles, I'm having to relive seeing that every single time. And it is, it's, I've seen death. I've seen people die in front of me. It hurts every time. Like, I have not built that callus within me where I can just see someone passing and especially someone who's literally crying for his mom who just died knowing that he's about to go see her again that's that's too rough like so I, my caution to those who want to know like if you actually want to know and care you have to do that work rather than re-traumatizing your your friends of color and asking them hey you know that time you saw someone die in front of your eyes can you tell me about that several times today like, if you actually care about what, like, you want to engage in that clip, then you have to do the hard work and stop asking your friends of color to do that work for you. But that's me, and I'm ranting. No, no, I, th no, this <laughs> no, is, this no, is what, no. this is what it needs to be, though. Um, uh, re response from, from the audience, you know, to, to my point before, um, you know, Robert said that, you know, in the sport, you can tap out and you can live. Yeah. Oh, man, that is real. That is he real. He wasn't given that option. George Floyd wasn't given the option to tap out. So, thank Nobody you. Nobody was. 
None of them were. You know, we had a guy that was just jogging, and he was he was he was gunned down. I mean, it wasn't even gunned down. He was cornered and killed. We had another woman that was her house was broken into, and she was shot. I that one kills me, and and I'm really proud of Denver and, and the way that we've protested here uh, on the peaceful side, which uh, I will say um, has not gotten nearly enough press and the love that is shown in the first part of the protest before things get wild. But I love that we did not forget to say her name. Yeah. Like, she was not forgotten in all of this for as much, like, uh, I'll, I'll get into it later about, like, the, the plight of Black it, women and how their voices get diminished while they're shouldering the burden of this. Um, but specifically, Breonna Taylor's bothers me because... Um, <clears throat> Not only is she killed in her own house, but now we have to deal with, like, this. It's going to hit on the point of Blue Lives Matter. But the fact that you've got her killed in her own house and now her boyfriend being charged with uh, assaulting a police officer. If you break into my house and you haven't identified yourself, you like anyone like this has happened to me before. And I guarantee you, anytime someone has uh, brandished a weapon in front of me. Uh, assaulted me has always ended up in the hospital always like that's just what's going to happen you can't charge someone for assaulting an officer when you break in when they have broken into your home that's like that's it, correct the fact that we had to rally for him to for the da to drop those charges is mind-boggling so it's not that like in, in some regards i've had people saying like why do why do black people hate the police and it's I have to be very careful in how I navigate that space because it's less about hating the police and more about hating a system that enables the police, these police unions, the district attorney uh, attorneys that work with them, that you have officers able to kill with impunity, meaning that they will not face consequences or in some cases they will face consequences and then be hugged by a judge and receive a lighter sentence than if the average citizen had committed the same crime. So the problem- Even is if they get in front of a ju judge to make yeah. it even- Yeah. You may not go and to trial. I, I, it's I, not the police. I, I, I'd even like to see how many officers who, one, never went before a judge, um, had murdered someone, and then appealed their Joe case it. with the police union and got their job back. That's exactly what happened with the George Floyd's case. Like, we see this long list of here are the grievances and deaths associated with the officer. Ah, he's fine. We'll leave him on the force. Like, what are we doing here? Like, so so when so when people hear Black Lives Matter, you shouldn't hear Blue Lives Don't Matter. What you should hear is that by saying Blue Lives Matter, that thin blue line that's separating the good guys from the bad guys, uh, there's a lot of bad guys on the other side of that line that are not being held to account. And that's the problem. Like, there, are, if you believe that there are so many good cops out there, then why is there a problem with prosecuting the bad ones so that all we have are good cops? It shouldn't be that difficult, right? But it's one of it's one things I saw. I'm sorry to cut you off there, Ryan. No um, if you have a thousand good cops and ten bad cops. And a thousand good cops don't turn in those ten bad cops. You have one thousand and ten bad cops. All right, that's plain and simple. Okay, I don't care how good you are, if you do not do the right thing. And 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 understand when people say blue lives matter, it always it irks me. Okay, it's the same. It, it irks me almost to the same level of when people say thank you for your service. Okay, and I'll tell you why. Because Black Lives Matter is more to me. Not in the, well, when you say Black Lives Matter or White Lives Matter or Brown Lives Matter, you know, Yellow Lives Matter, we were born into that. Okay, I was born black. Okay, somebody was born white. Somebody was born Asian. Somebody was born Mexican. But I chose the military. Okay, just like a cop chooses to be blue. 
So when people sit there and say blue lives matter, they do matter, but it was a choice they made. Well, the thing that I've always said, the thing that I've always said is this, is that when we say black lives matter, we are saying it because of the fact that things are happening to us within our communities that would communicate that our lives matter less because they aren't treated with the same value. And so we have to remind the society that our lives matter just as much as someone else's. You know, we've seen the times where, you know, there's a, there's been a, a, a little white girl who's blonde hair and blue eyes who gets kidnapped and every, and a manhunt goes across the, uh, 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 across the countryside looking for her. And then a black girl gets kidnapped and we may see one in the five o'clock news. Her, her photo gets thousands of BT women missing. Like, yeah. and no one talks about it. And, 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 and so we have to remind our society, and we, we, we have to remind the society that black lives matter. So, when you respond with blue lives matter, in order for blue lives to matter, black lives have to matter because black lives are blue lives. When you say all lives matter, you black lives have to matter because black lives are included in all lives. Well, not only that, Black lives are the lives that are much more disproportionately being put on the line and and coming up short as a result of their contact with the blue. So when we say yep. black lives matter, what we're really saying to you is we, we've been subhumanized so much right now that we need to scream out and let you know we're here. That's all that is. That is not a, 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 um, to, to disenfranchise um, the blue line. That is not to say... Other people don't matter at all. What we're saying is we've been subhumanized so long that we have to scream out loud. We have to cry. We have to protest in order to let you know we're still here and our lives matter. Don't don't quit subhumanizing us. All right. Ryan and I talked the other day, man, and I've really been thinking about, you know, some of the points that you made, Ryan. And one of the biggest takeaways that I I finally came back with, you heard me say it about the subhumanization (laughs) of individuals. And that's what this cop did. It may not have been a racist intent on his part, but the subconscious systemic racism that exists allowed him to subhumanize the nature of this human being that he was charged with protecting and caring for, not just arresting. When you arrest somebody, you're taking them into custody. Custody is is an actual legal terminology where you are charged with taking care of that individual until they've been adjudicated. Right. And he failed his in his duties right there because he he did not recognize the person who he was dealing with as a human being. And I I, I kind of take from that. How even posthumously he continued to be dehumanized by uh, a D.A. who refused to bring charges, who brought lesser charges once outcry like there were enough police that they fully surrounded the officer's house to Mm -hmm. to keep him safe so you thought that his safety was in like the police officer's matter life mattered that much more than george floyd and then on top of that the system gets even more broken when we look at the initial me report the problem is like i am not a doctor i can easily talk about MMA chokeholds. Uh, I, I can talk about losing uh, oxygen to the brain. And for the ME to not even take into consideration in his uh, initial response, um, the cause of death, uh, uh, the officer is a part of the cause of death. It's problematic, number one. And then number two, if you look at the report that was initially flown uh put out in, in the press. It was a mixture of what the police officer said and what the ME said, the police officer and me, police officer and me. So uh-huh. it, as you're reading that, you start to think, oh, the ME didn't say that uh, uh, the officer was um, uh, part of the cause of death. The ME never actually says that. And people didn't read those reports thoroughly because I had my own family coming up to me saying, oh, this looks bad. The ME says that the police officer didn't cause the death. I'm like, no, the police said that. The ME was talking about heart disease that had nothing to do with the actual death. 
But the police officer report is what keeps getting floated back into the ME report. So the system is broken and meant to appease public and try to de-escalate things without. We have to do our homework when we see information. It is not enough to take the headline. You have to do the work. The media, whether you consider them the enemy of the people or you just consider them flawed, their job is to drive clicks and advertisement. They can only, at best, spur your interest enough for you to go do the work. Right. You can't be mad at the media for doing what the media does. It is your responsibility to care. And just like I'm asking you to not ask your friends that are people of color to, to be your African-American studies professor, you can't trust One America News. You can't trust CNN. You can't trust Fox News to do that work for you. Their job is to put the story in front of you. Go do your work. The system is absolutely broken from start to finish. They dehumanized George Floyd when they murdered him. They dehumanized him when they didn't allow, uh, when they protected the cop more than they protected his own life. They dehumanized him when the court system refused to do their job and they continue on with the ME examination. Start to finish, this is where I have a problem with our system. It is not cops that are bad. It is when we talk about systemic um, injustice, this is how we show that it is systemic. It is not just bad cops. It is a bad system that does not work for us. We do not have a social contract that says, if I, as a citizen, break the social contract, I have a means of making reparation. The social contract for certain parts of our country means that my very nature of being present is a violation and is subject to death with no reparations. And that is my problem with systemic injustice and the dehumanization of not just black people, but specifically black people in this case. From time to time and time again, we see this. The system is broken. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in yeah. here real quick with with a couple of comments that are popping up from from people who are viewing this and and thank you guys for sticking with us as we as we talk through this. This is very raw for us, um, and so we're 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 saying what's on our hearts and what's on our minds. This is unfiltered, so you know um, we're in a very raw place. Um, so to John, um, you know, does that mean because you were talking about the 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 ten the thousand good the thousand cops and the 10 bad cops so a comment from from robert came out and he said does that mean that black or brown people who don't turn in criminals are all bad um you can't blame all cops most cops most black brown and white people are good we've come so far um then law enforcement is supposed to be held to a higher standard than your average citizen that's the whole point behind it that's why the, the duty behind their oath and those things so when, when you say hey you can't lump everybody into the same thing. Law enforcement officers are held to a higher degree, a higher standard, um, and and have a responsibility that is, that is totally above that of a normal citizen. These people are supposed to be running to the fire. You get what can, I'm saying? Can I hit you with a cultural awareness moment on that? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Go, go ahead, dog. Yeah. Go ahead. So the so one of the core reasons within the African American community that we don't call the cops and that we have a snitches get stitches policy is because of the systemic problems. Most people don't realize this, but Philly, for all of its crazy things that are happening right now, Philly had one of uh, a really affluent black neighborhood, like one of the richest in all of America for not just black people, but people in general. The U.S. government dropped a satchel bomb on their own neighborhood. Why? Because the black people who were doing really well there had a drug dealer move in and the black people called the police. The United States government dropped a bomb on its own people, clearing the neighborhood. And not one of those people who had their house destroyed was given any form of reparation. So you want to talk about destroying generational wealth. Why would I call the cops if it could lead to my death and the destruction of my family's wealth. Like, oh, Kalechi. Miss me with that. And, 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 Kalechi, and, and by the way, hold on. <laughs> let's, let's just make sure that happened in 1985. Okay? Yes, so, 85. In our lifetime. It, it did happen That's in that. our lifetime, but and, 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 and the crazy thing is, it happened in our lifetime and 
I don't remember hearing about it on the news. I don't remember Man. it being anything that we talked about. There was no outrage about it. It's, and, it's new to me. I've I've never heard. You didn't of know. It. Let's see that. And see, let me let me blow your mind one more time. And thank you, Kalechi, for for bringing it out because you took you my know, thunder there. Uh, uh, you you took <laughs> my thunder there because that's the second time that the government has dropped the bomb on us. All right, and I bring and the first time, which is kind of ironic, and it's a sad memorial, is the black the Black Wall Street riots of 19, uh, the early 1900s. I can't remember right off the top of my head. But... 20-something. Yeah, 1921, I want to say it's, it was was when it happened. 21. But That's right. Yeah. Guess... Hey, thank you. Uh, guess... <laughs> right? And that happened this weekend. Okay, back in 1921. And they dropped a bomb on what on Black Wall Street because it was the, it was, it was the richest area... It was the richest neighborhood for black folks at that time. At, at and they for whatever reason, was it jealousy? Was it um was it ignorance? It could be a great multitude. It happened. And that's the and they dropped bombs on us. So now that's the answer- that's the thing that we want to keep pulling that thread back on is that you know, I know for a lot of my friends out there, they see this death of George Floyd as an isolated incident that happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota, that was a bad cop. But no. it, it's been this period of time, it's been very unique because you can string this incident to what happened with Breonna uh, Taylor. Because what is that? Was that an isolated? Well, the cops got it wrong. They went to the wrong place. They, you know. You can't see these as isolated incidents because when you live in this society and you look like me and these are happening over and over again, I, Kelechi, I've, I've shared with Kelechi a, um, um, a collection that I have on Facebook and it's basically every time there is a killing of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a black, usually a unarmed black man. Every time there's some type of thing that's happened to black people, I, I, I save it away. And I've got, over the course of about two years, 700 or so different articles of wow. places where black people have been wrongly accused, who have been had the cops called on them, who have had who police have shot and killed or beaten black people for no reason or what I was talking to George about in violation of our civil rights. At the, at the end of the day, when, what, what, whatever happened with George Floyd, when the police were called on him and they were in the process of arresting him, he is guaranteed a trial by a jury of his peers. They have to give him that. If they don't give him that, they are violating the rights that are guaranteed to us. And it has been guaranteed to us all these years. And it keeps getting it it keeps getting violated from us. It keeps getting taken from us. So when we start talking about things like we don't have equal access to equal protection under the law, we don't because many of our people fail to get that trial by jury as of that point, even if they caught George Floyd red-handed. He is presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. And at that point, that officer became the judge, jury, and executioner of an American citizen. And we can't sit around and allow that to happen. But it has happened, and it continues to happen as we go back from 2020 to 2019 when these things were happening, to 2018, to 2017. We've gone back now to 1985, and now we've gone all the way back to 1921. And once we get to the 1920s, we're talking about lynchings that were just happening in broad daylight. We go back to the 1800s, and now we've back into slavery. And so when you start pulling that thread from six, what is it, 1614 or 1618? 1619. 1619. 1619, all the way to 2020, there is a stream and a timeline of incidents that have been plaguing our community. And so when we say Black Lives Matter, it's not Black Lives Matter today. 
It's Black Lives Have Mattered for four hundred years. So, let me let well first of all, let me answer the original question. Okay. If if there's uh if I'm uh, what is it black no, brown know. cop, if you are you like George said, if you made an oath, okay, to defend the people, you defend the people. It does not matter. Okay. You you made an oath to do it. I made an oath to the United States to defend its constitution. I defended it for seven years in the military, and I've been defending it ever since as a civilian. And I will never back down from defending it because that is what I swore to do. All right. I expect anybody who takes an oath to uphold their oath until the day they die. Even the ones that the FBI has already said that um, the... Um, certain white supremacist groups have been working since the early 60s to infiltrate the police force, and there's a significant number throughout all branches of uh, domestic policing. Oh, yes. But how are we going to expect those people to enforce the Constitution, enforce local laws, when they've literally been recruited to do the opposite? Well, see, then we have to ask the question, all right, are the laws really for us? You have to ask that question. Is it, are the laws, you know, is the Constitution for everybody except for us? And that's an honest question that we well, need to ask. Into it. <laughs> I know, right? You know, but I mean, it's something that we really have to ask. And we got to be honest about it because if we're not honest about the answer, we cannot truly fix because the first the first step to, to, to solving any problem is an omission of truth. Which is hard when any any challenge to constitution, to local laws, to law enforcement is unpatriotic, which is strange to me because these same people have anarchist military groups. These same people are like, like I've got friends who have like a full on military stash and they're ready to pick up arms against the government should they come for us. But you're mm-hmm. big mad that I'm going out in the street with no weapon and I'm unpatriotic because I won't just follow the law. You literally marched in Michigan with guns to your, your governor's mansion, to, they, to your courthouse. Just so you could open a business again. Yeah, like, and people don't seem what? to understand that we've been we have been rumbling and rebelling from day one from the jump. Okay, as one comedian once said, America was built on a series of jack moves. All right, let's just put it out there. All right, we've been rebelling everything. We rebelled against the king. We we constantly rebel against each other. And we don't know when to stop rebelling. It's built in our DNA that we protest if we don't like it. And now it's just to the point now that, and, and to, 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 to piggyback off of what Ryan was saying, is that we as, as a people have constantly been abused. This is not a, you know, I, I, I hate people when they think that we will, we, that this happened, this is an isolated incident happened and we went straight to rioting. No, we tried protesting. Okay, we tried kneeling and y'all told us we shouldn't do this. Y'all told us. Said it, was, said it was unpatriotic. Exactly. It was unpatriotic. Said it was a, a slight against the military. Shut up. Told and, us to do that. Shut up. Shut up and dribble. All right. We did. We did. We did it your way. And now y'all mad because we're rioting. People, this is when, when, hey, if you, if we talk to you at your language and you ignore us, then we're going to start talking crazy until it starts sounding like the Queen's English. Which is why I don't know why everyone who wants to post these uh, these these memes of what is his name Martin Luther King oh he never rioted That's he never name. looted and he changed yeah <laughs> go away <laughs> oh so now we can laugh now we can... <laughs> we're gonna make you crack Ryan we're gonna make you crack I love this you guys I really do <laughs> and, we, and we love you too all right but like why why isn't that meme shared of um, Martin Luther King talking about the riot is the voice of uh, of those who yeah, are heard. Why aren't we talking about uh, Martin Luther King regretting and saying that his dream was turned into a nightmare? Why aren't we talking about the fact that he Martin Luther he King fears. did not do this alone? That 
he literally needed the the carrot and stick approach of having a Malcolm X with direct action. Oh, so y'all don't want to listen to to quiet, so you'll catch these hands. You have to find the fact that Martin Luther King specifically chose his routes because he knew that the people he was coming up against were willing to beat children, have 14-year-old children beaten, gunned down, and attacked by dogs. Like, there's nothing peaceful about doing that. The government didn't launch Pro just because he was peaceful. They knew that he, he, had, he had the whole mass of having that carrot and stick behind him. So to the point where the FBI was literally telling him to kill himself or they would. Like, if you want me to follow that meme and say that he, he never rioted, he never looted, he never protested and uh, not protested, um, whatever it was, and he changed the world, you are literally telling me as a black man, shut up and get murdered. It's the That's same reason. It's the, the, the same reason that they that people use that meme, and I've seen that meme several times, and I've told and I've and I've stated it is the same reason that they had that meme. Is the same reason that Diamond and Silk are Trump's Trump's puppets. Mm-hmm. Oh, were Trump puppets? Like the moment you step out of line, Fox cuts you. Interesting. Oh, interesting. For the same line around COVID nineteen that everyone else on the Fox show had. They were the only ones who got cut. Kind of mm. wild, huh? Mm. Kind of wild. I, I mean, we could. I could say some about. things, but I think it's a level that we won't go. So, yeah. so let 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 let's 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 hit on some of the other topics. Um, yeah. You know, one one of the things is the appropriate way to to protest because <laughs> we we do see the the difference between Colin Kaepernick and how he was villainized by the NFL, by fans all across the NFL for kneeling during the national anthem to protest this very topic that was going on back then. And it continues to this day. Yet, for COVID-19 and the right of access to go where people want to go, we've got people storming the state houses armed, standing in front of police officers, nose to nose, screaming in their faces and the police are showing restraint because blue lives matter somehow except when they infringe upon my rights but but that's the thing though right is not only is the peaceful protest whether it's kneeling at a football game during the national anthem or marching um you know in in public it's the fact that we are not that is seen as out of line if we do that Yet, I, we saw all over the country white people grabbing their guns and going to the state house and menacing lawmakers from being able to go in and do their jobs at, at government buildings. Like These things were happening as protests, and they were seen as patriotic, even at, had support of our president who said, free Michigan. Those those were seen as appropriate ways to express displeasure with the government. Yet, a peaceful protest that disrupts traffic, we're told, run over those people. And they when did a, in some cases. In some cases, they did. When a peaceful protest disrupt the national anthem, and it doesn't, matter of fact, it didn't disrupt it, but because it happened during the national anthem, it was seen as you're misusing your platform that you were given. And so there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an inequality in our ability to access freedom under equal protection under the law. There's an inequality when it comes to our ability to express our displeasure with the law. So how do we affect change if we can't even communicate in the same way that other people can, when we are unhappy with the laws that exist, that are oppressing and affecting us? It's not a rhetorical question to me. I am literally posing that to everyone who wants to tell me that this is wrong. Tell me one way that you that you have supported protesting in the past. Uh-huh. Like, how is it supposed to be done better? Like, I'm willing to admit that we have two different Americas and that what works for you is not okay for me. So tell me how I can put an issue in front of the nation and you will actually listen without calling me a son of a dog. I, I don't 
Okay, I'm going to play the other side of this piece. What we see going on, police brutality, the, the, the subhumanization of people by officers and all out just racism, the systemic racism that's taking place is not a black people problem to solve. Only white people can solve this problem. And until white people decide that enough is enough, it will never be solved. Plain and simple. We're sitting here having this conversation, but the truth is, this is not a black folks problem. We can't fix it. We don't, we don't have the tools. We are not equipped. to. There is nothing black people can do to fix this. This is a white people problem that white people have to solve. And until they recognize that, nothing will be done about it. We will continue to see George Floyd. We will continue to see Freddie Grays. We'll continue to see Mike Browns. We're going to continue to see all those names throughout the years that we've seen. I, man, that there's so much truth in that to unpack. Um, I, I do this thing where uh, I know that people shut down when they start to feel shame. So I want to take a moment to reiterate, like, while, while we're passionate, uh, there's not a single one of us who, who doesn't have members, uh, uh, people in our lives who, uh, who don't have the same ethnic background as, as us. Like, um, so there is not coming from a place of hate, of malice. And I think it's okay. Uh, and this is something that hasn't happened a lot for people is to witness black people emoting and not take it as anger and not take it as like, uh, I, I think it's very foreign to a lot of people, uh, to see black men emote and they don't have, have a, a box to put that so so you automatically see anger and, and take it as fear and and you shut down so for for our non people of color out there just a reminder that this is coming from a place of love and frustration the two things can simultaneously exist like this isn't a, all white people are bad because that's, that would say that people no, that absolutely I love not. are bad yeah so and just, that's not what i'm saying when yeah, i say I this is a white people that problem that. to solve that's yeah, not what yeah. i'm saying and and i it is those it will be those white people who are good natured, who have a conscience, who yeah. want to do the right thing that help solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely agree. It, it is something that I that I have frequently said, um, and 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 I'll say it again. And it's that no right has ever been fought for and awarded to the minority by the minority. Yeah. In every case, when rights have been uh, been awarded to the minority it has been because the majority has willed it to be that is that is huh. that is that is it i mean even look at the signature on the bottom of 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 the civil rights act is that a black man's signature how many black people voted for that i mean yeah. we fought we marched but at the end of the day the signatures were all white people and so no right. If you look at even women's suffrage, it was men that had to give women's suffrage to women. Also, they wanted to make sure that uh, black men had less voting power than white women. Thank, th I mean, thank you, thank you for, like for the history that. for the history test. The history <laughs> yes, Look, that was that was part of the argument for women's we, suffrage. We, yes, we need we need a time here right now. This is your cultural awareness moment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Look, that that, that was part true, of the argument. My dad for was sure. not going to let me be a historian. Yeah, um, <laughs> but that is the case. Is that when you look at any point in time when there was inequality and the society made the decision to provide a level of equality for a group that was oppressed, it came at the hands of the majority. And in this case, George, you're right. This isn't something that. We can we can get the most impassioned speakers. We can do this for generations, and we will never gain the equality that we that we're asking for until our white brothers and sisters say enough is enough. And and this is the this is the conversation that I was having with some friends of mine is that you know it there has to be an identification of our plight internally within the rest of society. You will never know what it's like to be black. You will never know what it's like to, to, to have that constant fear that many of us have 
when we go into places that we don't know, when we have to be asked to do things um, that we aren't comfortable with because we're the only black person there or we're the person who's never been in this neighborhood before and we're trying to find something, um, but it's a, it's an all white neighborhood and, 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 and we're, we're, we're driving slowly trying to look at house numbers. That there are things that, that that we have in our in our in our heads that we're thinking about. Maybe we can talk about that and unpack that a little bit. But the point that I'm getting at is, there is a level of empathy right now that um, um, Brene Brown talks about the difference between empathy and sympathy. That what we're seeing right now, this outpouring of emotion that's happening in our society and in America right now, is sympathy. Now, when I look at George Floyd dying on that ground. I see the potential that that could be me because I look like George Floyd because I'm a, I'm a black man like George Floyd. But the fact is, is that many Americans don't look like him. They're not from where he was from. They don't have the background that he has had. And so if they see that that what happened was wrong, it is a sympathetic emotion that happens there. Yeah. What we need, and in order for us to get to the point where you're at, talking about, George, is we need that sympathetic point to become an empathetic point, and and the rest of America can see themselves being held on the ground by that way with a knee on their neck. And the only thing that I can say is is deep, dig down deep in your own soul and summon up that experience that you had. Summon that experience of when you were afraid, when you thought you were going to die. And now think about that every single day. And if you can summon that image every single day, then you begin to experience what it's like to be one of us. And if you can experience that every single day and start getting that feeling and getting that exhaustion of always being on the edge and always having that little voice asking you whether or not this is a safe thing to do, then the next time you see inequality happening, you can see yourself in that moment and you can speak up and amplify the voices that you're hearing tonight. That's what we need you to do. We need you to retell these stories. We need you to amplify and authenticate these in places where we don't exist. I will say that there is an interesting burden that I, I, I feel like I, I'm playing the role in some, in some case in the statement of protecting, but I don't mean it as a protective type of statement. But for non-people of color, I can see how like some of your first thought would be like, well, I, I've been in a class where I was the only white person and, and everyone else around me was black. That is not the same experience because you still are in the majority culture and there is an implied power that you have. And if something happens in that class, you are still going to be believed by the police more so than any place else. So at best, you can have an approximation and I feel for you, but I, I think it's there needs to be a caution behind how you see yourself in the empathy. And it's about feeling that way rather than saying, oh, I've, I've been the only white person in a place. Because that's not the same experience of your skin color can be the thing that kill, gets you killed for simply being present. Like you still have a power that has not just been granted to you magically, but because the society you live in sees your body as more valuable you will never walk in the same space that I walk in. Like you can, you have a luxury of forgetting who you are in a space. I'm constantly aware of how my words affect others. I'm constantly worried about my posture. Like I cannot be seen as more of a threat only because I walk into a space as black. And that, like be empathetic, but don't try to steal and make the story about yourself. And, and I think that's I think that's a, that's a valid point. But I, I don't want to create that line, that barrier that says, don't try. Don't try yeah. to empathize. Don't try to cross that line. Because, you know, if, if you if you say to yourself that I will never know. You, 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 you will never truly experience it. Yeah. But you can know. And, 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 and that's the thing is it's that pursuit of knowledge. What Kalechi started saying at the very beginning of this, of, of this video is the fact that it is incumbent upon you to know. 
don't just ask. We're going to share our stories, and we've been sharing our stories um, throughout this hour. But it is incumbent upon you to take it upon yourself to learn on your own, to begin to learn actually what happened with Dr. Martin Luther King and not just what happened in the picture on the meme that has been captioned. It is incumbent upon you to find out who George Lloyd, uh, George Floyd was. It is incumbent upon you to understand that history of oppression that continued after the Civil War. And I know what you're laughing at. And it's not the right time. I'm sorry. And it's so me. inappropriate. John, that it's a, that John <laughs> you, you, you don't say anything. Share, share, share. I'm not gonna. I'm not, this is that's Ryan's story this to is tell. That moment. This is okay. our moment. I told you it was gonna uh, happen, dude. We can't. <laughs> all right. So, so understand, Ryan, that we are it, we are down this rabbit hole, and I every love now you, and then every we're gonna way. we're I gonna you. we're gonna hit some sheds light, and this is just one of them. So I'm gonna leave that story for Ryan to tell because it's his story. I want to hug you so bad right now. That was. <laughs> I, I, I saw you. It's I awesome. saw you smirk, and I knew it. You know, this is why I can't play poker with y'all. I just <laughs> this. <laughs> my bad, my bad. Um, John, what you got? Man, I, there's just so much to unpack. Um, uh, John, I'm not I was gonna say before up? you go there. Ryan, Ryan made a statement about getting to know George Floyd. Okay. And I, I saw um, a video that Vice did on him today, mm-hmm. and they talked about his his background and origins. He apparently, I think he was born in North Carolina, but he was raised or spent um, a, a vast amount of time down in Houston. Yeah. And to some point became a local rapper, so much so that he was on several of DJ Screw's mixtapes. He's got lyrics on DJ Screw's mixtapes. I don't know yeah. if you guys were aware of that. Yeah. Bro, I'm going back for that. That's yeah. fire. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, his voice it, it will live on in some shape, form or fashion. Um, but apparently he also was a pretty good football player, um, from what I understand. Yes. And yes, um, you know, I have heard that. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, so some point around 2007, he was involved in um, I, I want to say it was either a burglary or a home invasion. Uh-huh. He went to he went to prison for about five years. Um, he got out of prison. Decided he was going to leave Texas, start over, made a move to Minneapolis. As so many Southerners do, they seek to get out of the South because there's that, you know, that connotation that things are a little bit more hectic down here when it comes to race relations. So many of us vacate and head north. That's what he did. And you can't get away from this. Again, this goes back to what I said. Racism is not a problem that black people can solve. There's nothing we can do to fix it. It is incumbent upon our white brothers and sisters to take the time to handle this problem. And they don't even recognize it as a problem right now. Oh, I think they recognize it as a problem now. I don't think so. The problem right now is looters, protesters, and and riots. That's the problem right now. Go find me a video of someone else talking about George Floyd's history, background, makeup, his origin, things he did in his life. And then let's compare to how many videos are out right now about protesters, rioters, and everything else. We have totally lost this. And many people are going to say it's our own fault because we're the ones out doing this. But we're not. Have y'all seen the videos out of all the bricks being placed in different areas where they oh, yeah. know that protesters are going to be? What about uh, the, the whole auto zone? I'm sorry to da- cut you off. Dallas about. Police Department is investigating that right now. They, Dallas Police Department said, we don't know where these bricks came from. We have no idea. There, there's, not, there's no reason why they should have been, been down there. There were some directly across the street from one of the courthouse, not the courthouse, but um, one of the main buildings down here in Dallas. Over in Denton, the same thing happened. Right on the square where there was supposed to be a, a protest going on, all of a sudden a huge pile of bricks shows up. Here in McKinney, the same thing happened. Huge pile of bricks on a corner where allegedly there was going to be some some um, protesters. And we keep hearing this theme all throughout. Law enforcement, is, I don't know if you, you guys know, I do have a law enforcement background. I worked probation and parole for 10 years over in Tennessee, specifically with sex offenders. Um, so th- this, this isn't, you know, something that I, I can't speak on and don't have knowledge on. When I tell you about the subhumanization of individuals, 
I know it because I've done it. I've been guilty of it myself. Mm. You hear what I'm saying? But there, there are some strange forces at play throughout this whole thing, man. There, there, there's a lot of moving parts going on that a lot of people don't recognize, don't want to speak on, and that a lot of us who are out there protesting don't realize is taking place. That's something I, I want to make sure I, I put into this particular podcast is before you go posting something that looks sensationalized, make sure you've done the work. I've had many friends uh, talking about, oh, a white man was pulled out by uh, a, a black crowd and killed, and then only to find out that he wasn't killed, and that in, in the couple of cases that were brought to my attention, uh, the non-person of color had actually attacked the crowd with a weapon, uh, whether a bow and arrow, whether- uh, Saw that one. Saw, saw that. that. Bruh, you are not Nighthawk. Like, who does <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Dang it! No, so Nighthawk. Then, hold on, I got you. I got you, Kalechi, on the save. Nighthawk is a Mortal Kombat car- character, so there you go. Thank you. That is Native American. Uses a tomahawk and a bow and arrow. Sorry. That's exactly what I was talking about. I don't know what Ryan's on. He was. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, Ryan? <laughs> so, but Kalechi, I think it's. I think I, I'd, I'd love for you to share the story that you were sharing before. That you have gone. Are you gonna play my music? No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna play your music. Yeah. Um, so, but will you so tell? So the, will you tell the story? This, yeah. So I think part of this is also to remember that what you're watching on the news. I am a big news fan, and I will always. Uh, I, I will always go back to that notion of it is your own responsibility to do the work. The news is really just there to get you interested and you've got to do your own work. So on that, like I've seen a lot of people talking about what's happening at the protest and they're doing so from behind the keyboard. So it was really important for me that no matter what happens in in all of this, 2020 is a a history book year. Like you can't skip (laughs) over this. man. And and I know for me, my dad fought in the Nigerian civil war uh, and the Biafran war. Mm. And it is different when I ask my dad what it was like to fight in the war than when I ask some other people's parents who they fled. Nothing wrong with that. It's a civil war. Like, yes, flee. Um, but for those who were able to flee, like their stories are just different. They they don't have the nuance and the complexity of, of what was going on in real time. So I, as scared as I was based on what was happening on the news, I said, hell or high water, COVID, come what may. I'm making my voice heard and my body will be counted. So I show up to the protest. There's there's two things that happen. One, I had never witnessed so much love and care from so many people who did not look like me. I live in Denver now. Population wise, if it was all black people, (laughs) there'd have been like seven of us outside. (laughs) So (laughs) <laughs> to get this crowd of thousands, <laughs> like, you know, I'm gonna throw some levity in here it was crazy. But so I, I wanted to make sure that that part of the story gets told. But the other thing that's really important and why Ryan had me uh, tease this is that I am notorious for having low cell phone battery and low gas in my tank. It's just, I'm irresponsible. Like it's how I'm always going to be. So I pull up on E to the Capitol and I'm like, yo, I got to figure this out. Get over to the uh, um, the gas station, the 7-Eleven across from the uh, the Capitol building, and there are always uh, a gang of I, I won't call them a gang, uh, a bunch of homeless people that line around that 7-Eleven asking for change and just trying to get by. Um, and as I'm pulling up and, and putting gas in, I'm upset with myself because I didn't bring my motorcycle, and it would have been a great day to bring the motorcycle. And here comes a gang of motorcycles. I'm like, oh, this is dope. So I'm looking at these motorcycles, and it's these guys who are fitted out in all black tactical gear on their motorcycles, and all of them white. Uh, not not surprising. I'm again, I'm in Denver, but they get off their bikes. They're they're coordinating stuff with each other, having these conversations about, hey, we're going to meet up here, going to go here, and then a group of them walks over to the homeless people, hands them money, and says, at six o'clock, go back to the Capitol. We're going to riot. They are literally paying people to riot. And these are unwell people. But on the news, what we're going to see, or what we did see, is all the black faces that were left from the original uh, riot, uh, from the original protest. But that's interspaced with actual rioting happening with people covered up in their balaclavas 
And I'm like, hold on. So I literally witnessed people being paid to riot. But that's not the storyline that gets put out in the media. Yeah. And then I look at like undercover cops who are just really bad at their jobs. Like I can see your handcuffs. <laughs> You're wearing his black shoes. Um, I didn't see the wire. Uh, I'll go with that. But I did see the handcuffs and I did see them literally meeting in the middle of the street saying, hey, where are we going next? Hey, where are we going next? And it was those plainclothes officers who then went back to a peaceful protest that started with prayer, started with prayer and conversations from babies. It was it, it was those cops who who decided that they wanted to be agitators and started pushing back. They're pushing into the crowd, getting people all excited, and now they're literally funneling us into a construction area. How does a conversation, a protest that's starting off with a call to a higher power for peace and love and showing respect to the police, how does that turn into a riot? When the people have literally said, we are here to support you. I personally walked up to police and was like, I support you and I want you to do better. How do we go from that to the riot? And no one is talking about the peace and no one is talking about the police officers being the agitators. So for the keyboard warriors who are telling me that, oh, no, this is fake and all these black people are doing the looting. I'm like, show up. If you want a peaceful riot, show up. Be an agent of change and find out who's really doing what. I, I can't tell you how many videos I've seen, like you said, where there, there are these agents of, of chaos appearing out of places. Today I saw a video of, of two young women, not women of color, who were out spray painting and doing things. And they got confronted by black people. And I, I couldn't make out what they were saying, whatever, but they basically got chased off. And I remember this, the sister who confronted him was like, we didn't ask you to do that. This, yeah, this is not what this is about. And, and on top of that, you know, it, it's I don't know, man. I, I just it, it, I feel like I feel like this. This. This issue is being hijacked and led down another path. Okay. I, I, I don't know if you guys got a chance. Confirmed that. Yeah. I don't know if you got a chance to to watch Trump's speech this evening. He did like a 10, 15 minute speech. Mm -hmm. I implore you guys, go back and watch that, man. It to me and all, all I can do is speak from my experience. But it reeked of Hitler speaking to a, a German crowd, pumping up his 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 constituents. His yeah. I mean, the things he said, he, he told he was telling his constituents, I will protect you. I will make sure that this is taken care of. And he, he I mean, it was dog whistling all throughout the speech, man. Go back and watch it if you get a chance. Well, he is threatening to 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 override the governors and bring in the military if they don't if they don't do something to handle it. Okay, not so on, let's, uh, yeah. Okay. Not only that, he specifically he stated he's going to use the Insurrection Act of what is it, nineteen eighteen oh seven. Okay, and in order to enact military, not just National Guard, regular military on American soil. Okay, and there's crazy. a problem with on the gun nuts. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. No, it's okay. But no, it's a. It'll be illegal if he does it. For it to act, for the Insurrection Act to actually be invoked, the governors have to ask the president. Only then can the president go ahead and do that. You're All right. Drop they, knowledge. Hey man. Hey, I, I I was a paralegal in a former life. So See, you know, the, <laughs> the way he was speaking on that speech today, I I, on I I I would. <laughs> I would not be surprised how many laws get violated in order to enact the agenda that he's setting forth. He, he's telling these governors not just to quell this, to go out and dominate. He wants a show of force so strong. And the, the words that he, he, he's using can't help but incite further violence. My biggest fear right now is that the militia groups uh, get a get a get a get a, a hair up their butts to try and so, do something. That's there was my another said, dog. There was, That's there, there was another dog whistle moment in his speech where he specifically said, I will protect your second amendment right. That is a, who was that, is who was that pointed to? That's the militia and the gun nuts. This is what I don't get. Like, let them fight the military. They've been dying for a fight all along. If you want to co-op this movement and, and no, end no, up no, dying no. at the hands of the strongest military, like, Kalechi, Kalechi, they won't be going after the military. 
they're going to be going after the rioters and the looters and the protesters. Okay, because the militias will, it is my biggest fear. Okay, and I'm not going to say that they will be targeting them, but it's my biggest fear that these groups will plow into the, in, into, into the protests doing, doing the work of Donald Trump. Yeah. That is my I mean, biggest it's, fear. It's happened. I don't know if you you guys saw it on our uh, YouTube or restream for Facebook or something, but someone just stated that another 18 wheeler just plowed into a crowd of people. Jesus Christ! I, I, okay, so I started looking that up. I ca- I haven't been able to, to to find the story yet. So um, there was one where a tanker truck drove through as protesters were, but no one got injured. Um, I don't. I I haven't found the 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 FedEx 18 wheeler story yet. So that's why I didn't I didn't put it on there. Um, what what happened with the driver of that tanker? That was there anything said on that? Is he okay? I Everybody knows. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Um, so you know, we, we want to go back and reiterate. We're, we, we've gotten just over the hour. Um, we want to go back and reiterate the fact that the things that we are talking about is 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 not meant to be in 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 extreme absolutes, right? That we recognize that. Yes, there are police officers out there who are good, who are marching alongside. I've seen great stories of there being um, what was I think it was like the chief of police or or, or a sheriff stopping and talking and 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 saying what sh- what can I do right now? And they're like march with us. And he said okay, and and he went marched with them. They're, that we are not making absolutes of talking about all police officers. We're, we're we're not yeah. we're not we're not making absolutes and talking about no, all white no. people. We're not even making absolutes in 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 talking about the protesting and 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 whatever rioting is going on. That we recognize that at the end of the day, rioting is a bad thing. But at, but what we're trying to illustrate, especially given the fact that Kalechi saw this firsthand, is the fact that we have to be able to to moderate our perspective at a distance of what's going on on the street level at who is actually creating the havoc, that what is being assigned because there are black people who are very upset about what happened with George Floyd that are protesting right now and that there are riots, that those riots that may not be created by the people who are protesting are being assigned to those protesters. That, that what is being given the, the visibility is the riot and when you when you associate that improperly to the protest, then what that does is it discredits that protest, and that takes away the voice of the people who were trying to peacefully protest what's going on. And you can't allow that to happen. You can't be jaded and allow that confirmation bias to happen. You have to do the work to find out what's actually happening on the street. Kalechi, I see you've got a, you've got something to say. And then you, no. George. Uh. Uh, okay, I, I got John. something to say. Uh, I'm, um, first of all, thanks to uh, Adriana Parra. Uh, she's one of our listeners. Um, she sent. She lives in Minneapolis. Okay, and there's a report here that states that uh, Minneapolis residents are finding incendiary devices and gasoline stashed around yards and alleys. Bam! Come on. Now this, now this is also okay. And let's talk about what, uh, what, what, what happened the first night when they burned the the police station down, and the night before where they burned the, the auto zone down. Now there's video of a guy that actually did it that's been identified as a cop, okay, and that went around busting up the windows to the auto zone, and he was confronted and he ran and he basically walked away. Uh, the second part I had I, I want to talk about was the burnt the burning down of the police station. I have a lot of problems with that because one thing yeah, people didn't I don't know if anybody actually watched the whole riot protest go down, but two things threw me off was one the cops actually had the high ground and they were dropping tear gas and whatnots and, and flashbangs onto the crowd below, and they pulled away from that. Okay, you're not supposed to pull away from the high ground. That's a tactically advantaged position. You literally control the, you could control the entire ride from up there. 
Secondly, we only saw four cops. Now they did an overhead shot twice of that entire scene. And if you looked in the, if you actually, if, if we can find that video at one point, I play, I implore everybody to look for it. If you look at the back of the building, because they showed that the, that the parking lots were on fire, but in the back of the police building, you saw at least uh, 10, 10 vehicles there, 10 police vehicles, and they were all in a line. Okay, if you actually do the math, there's usually two, two uh, people per vehicle, two officers per vehicle. That's at least 20 people there. We only saw five at the most, and then they pulled off. And then shortly after they pulled off, that's when they let the people storm a police station. There is a big problem with that, in my opinion, being that you do not leave, you do not abandon a police station. A police station, believe it or not, is designed to be defended. Okay, the only time you abandon a post is if you've been ordered to. And then, yeah. com and then conveniently, we see a fire start. Now, am I saying that there's an agent provocator there? I'm just saying that it's it, it's there's too many things going on to try and cause a riot here. So I want I want to go back to this. I want to go back mm -hmm. to that is the, that is the complexity of us trying to protest. That oh. at, the end, at the at the end of the day. Yeah. When we try to have a peaceful protest, it is still, there are still elements in our society that would want to try to turn it into something destructive. So what, how do you now express yourselves? This is the, this is the question that I really want you, because I'd like for us to, before we wear out our welcome, if you will, I, I, I want us to. I want I want I want you guys to think about that. If indeed that the best protest is a peaceful protest, and in the event of someone trying to have a peaceful protest, there are other elements, whether they be um associated with law enforcement, whether they be associated with groups that are outside or militias or what wherever, you know, and they are going into these places where protests are happening. And they are creating destruction that is then being assigned to the protest. How then does a person protest without having their message obscured by the damage created by people who are not associated with the protest? This is how Black Lives Matter got the, the label of being a black version of the Ku Klux Klan. I've heard so many people say that about Black Lives Matter because there were people who showed up at a Black Lives Matter, black Lives Matter rally in protest and took action in their own hands and were unrelated to the people who were protesting and they did destructive things and so it got glommed on to the name of Black Lives Matter and it, it, it marred their name and, and it kept people from listening to the message that they had. So that worked, and it looks like it's working again because people are losing the the message in 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 the damage, and they are using words like thugs to describe people who are not actively engaging in the destructive nature of the pro uh, of of the riot. They're not participating in that. So this is a complex matter. It's raw. It's emotional, and I appreciate all of you for sticking with us for over an hour, listening to what we had to say about this. What I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna let each person kind of have a 30 second to just kind of wrap up. George, I'll start with you. You have just 30 seconds of, of just some, how you feeling right now? I, I'm speechless. But what I do wanna say is as far as doing something right now, from what I understand, there's a there June July seventh is going to be what what's termed as National Blackout Day, and that we as a a, a a a people are being asked to not spend money that day to impact wallets. I don't you know I don't know what the end game is on that, but it's something that's out there. If you have a chance, look it up, check on it, find out more about it, see if it's something you're interested in participating in. I challenge each of you to do that. Um, I've got to do my own research on it, but I, 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 right now I'm poised with 
what can I do actively myself other than get out and protest and riot? And I don't want to do that. That's not that's not where my head is. So that's what I'm looking at right now. All right. John Keys. Um, you know, the world is crazy. Um, all I'm asking is for you to do what's going to what. What do the right thing? Do what's going to make you sleep, go to sleep at night. All right, it's not that hard to do. Okay, well, I take that back. It's the right thing is head always hard to do. The right thing is always. It's not the times when it's easy. It's times when it's hard. Is when we want to stand up. Be or, or better yet, sum it up like this: Be the change that you want to see. All right, there it is, and and learn to salute with. The hand, like so, that, 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 that's too far to the temple, to the temple, sir, here. to the temple. Yeah, thank you. They, oh, oh. So, Kalechi, you got your thirty seconds. Go ahead. Off my camp. <laughs> Go ahead, Kalechi. Go ahead. Go ahead. As far as tangible things, uh, um, um, I, I'm working on pulling together a list, but there, there there's tons of resources um, um, that are available to you. Um, uh, I, I think uh, I want to reiterate my statement at the top of the, the show here is that your friends that are people of color, they want to be there for you, but you've got to do your work too. You can't just lean on us to be your your professors here. Like, do your work. Um, uh, it, it's hard to put all of this in here, but I'm just going to leave it at that. It's it's hard. There's so much to, to put in, but do your work is the primary and that's it. Uh, for me, it's really around remembering the fact that at the end of the day, you have to be the ones to stand up and be vocal and share our stories and amplify our stories. And and that means you being proactive and going out and making new connections and finding new friends of people of color. Not just the people that you share an eight to five with, maybe not just your neighbor, but be proactive in going out and making those connections that we haven't had so that now we see, I always say that our we will always hold on to our pre prejudices until we get names and faces for our prejudice. And once we have a name and a face for our prejudice, we will then be able to let it go. And I encourage you that if you can't see yourself in the George Floyds or the Breon Taylors or the Ahmad Arbery's of the world, then go and find someone so that when you, when you see that happen, then you can see your friend your close friend, someone you care about being that person, because it's only when you can then empathize with that moment, with that person, because you know someone, because you can identify with, because it's in there in your heart, you can then have that conviction that drives you beyond just these moments that are happening right now that will go into those times of peace and quiet that continue that you will continue to have that fight. I know that I'm, I've gone over 30 minutes, but at the end of the day, at 30 seconds, sorry. Um, but that's that's the point that I, I, I'm trying to make. Guys, thank you for letting me co-op our MMA conversations that we have every week to have this conversation. It's it's one, um, it's one, It's one that has meant a lot to me, and you guys have helped me put more words to the emotions that I've been feeling on this. And it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's always something that is, is a treat to be able to listen to the varied perspectives that we have on this. Um, thank you. I love you guys. Let's, let's wrap this up. On behalf of George G. Money Stallworth, John Keyes, Kalechi Onyebuchi, this is Ryan Smith reminding you to keep your hands up, your chin tucked, <laughs> and throw bombs. We'll catch you next time. Somebody.